Hello everybody, LifeSite News is coming to you today from the Apostolic Palace. As you see here behind us, we are actually in the, the Pope's residence, the place of, of uh, all things Vatican. And uh, we are here thanks to the graciousness of the papal theologian. Father Giertik is with us today, and uh, we are in his apartments here. And uh, Father Giertik, can you tell us a little bit about your role as the papal theologian? There is a long-standing tradition in the Holy See from the Middle Ages that there is a Dominican within uh, the papal court or within the Holy See uh, with the task and the, the office of the papal theologian. It used to be known as the master of the sacred palace. And the most important uh, mission that I have here is that all the speeches which are written for the Pope before the Pope receives them they have to be checked and within the procedure of the speech writing the papal theologian has to ensure that the text is acceptable and then of course the Holy Father is free to ad lib, to add, to change, to drop to. but nevertheless the idea is that what he's given, what is prepared for him is also theologically correct and so that's the reason why I live here in the Apostolic Palace and add my uh, my mission is basically that. Of course, there are other things which I'm doing as well, but that is the, the fundamental reason. Beautiful. Beautiful. Now, what, uh, in terms of your own background, what, what gets you to this spot? What kind of uh, education and, and things like that? Well, I think what, what got me into this spot is a pure decision of the Holy Spirit. You know, I was not working, <laughs> to, <laughs> striving to be given this position. But uh, for years I had been uh, teaching moral theology, primarily in Krakow and Poland, in the House of Studies of my, of my province. I was working in formation of young Dominicans in Poland, and then for many years I had been teaching at the Pontifical University Saint of St. Thomas Aquinas, the Angelicum, here in Rome. And I had been a member of the General Council of the Order, first as being responsible as the socius of the Master of the Order for Central and Eastern Europe, and then for intellectual life, so dealing with the paperwork between the various academic institutions of the Order and the Holy See. And that was due to end, and I was called to this position. And so here I am. Beautiful. One of the other, I think, huge debates or, or contentions that the world has with the Church, maybe even more so than contraception, many have even forgotten about that, comes with the area of homosexuality particularly today around the world, same-sex marriage has been being passed all over the place, but it then goes a level deeper where um, once passed, as it has been passed in our, my nation of Canada, the state tries to encroach even upon Catholic schools to make them alter the church's teaching around, in the area. Again, this is not an issue which is, which, uh, uh, which is reacting against the church's teaching. This is a fundamental anthropological change. This is a distortion of humanity, which is being proposed as an ideology, which is being supported, financed, promoted by uh, those who are powerful in the world in many, many countries simultaneously. The church is the only institution uh, in the world which has the courage to stand up to this, uh, to this ideology. Mm -hmm. and I've seen the communist ideology which seemed to be so powerful and is gone. Uh, mm -hmm. Ideologies come and go but, uh, and they, uh, they, they have the idea of changing humanity, of changing human nature. Human nature cannot be changed, it can be distorted. But the elevation of perversion to the level of a, uh, of, a, of a fundamental value that has to be nurtured and nourished and, and, and promoted, uh, this is absolutely sick. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, what we are observing in many countries worldwide, certainly in the, in the 20th and now in the 21st century, there is an enormous extension of the responsibility of states. Now, the more the state is encroaching on the economy, on, on family life, on education, huh? the state is saying that only the state has the monopoly to decide about these things. The more the state is omnipotent, the more the ethical standards are lowered. Because it's impossible to promote high ethical standards by the state. The church may promote high ethical standards because the church has the grace of Christ, has the living word of God. The state 
lowers the, uh, the, the ethical level uh, to the level of the approval of, uh, of sinful acts, of perversion, of, of uh, distortion of humanity. Now, we began talking about contraception and homosexuality is tied with it because since contraception destroys the quality of uh, relationships amongst the spouses uh, and it generates uh, sexual license outside marriage and it reduces sexuality to an easy source of pleasure with no responsibility. You know? That pleasure without responsibility, without love, is never satisfying and it generates like a drug, it gen generates a hunger for even more pleasure which is <laughs> even more not truly satisfying, not giving ultimate happiness. And so there is a search for more perverted types of, of sexual pleasure which, which can never fulfill the human person. Huh? Mm. So homosexuality is a, is a distortion. Huh? Now, of course, many people fall into this trap for various reasons and not necessarily for a fault of their own. Huh? There are people who are emotionally fragile because they come from broken families, because contraception and abortion has destroyed families, has generated divorces. People who are born uh, and unloved and, and not formed well, not nourished, they are emotionally fragile and they easily, they easily fall prey to sexual deviations. Huh? And uh, it's not a question of assessing their culpability. Sometimes maybe they're not culpable. Huh? they've been drawn into it. So certainly, uh, I think we can say that the, the percentage of people who have this problem is greater maybe now than in the past. And of course they have to be treated with dignity. Everybody has to be treated with dignity. and Even sinners have to be treated with dignity. But the best way of treating people with dignity is to tell them the truth. And if we escape from the truth, uh, we're, not, we're not treating them with dignity. And so homosexuality is against human nature. Now there are many things that people do which are unnatural. Smoking cigarettes is also unnatural. You can live with the addiction to uh, tobacco, you can die of it. Huh? But there are people who are addicted to tobacco and yet they live and, and we, we meet with them and we deal with them and we don't deny their dignity. So certainly homosexual, people with the homosexual difficulty have to be respected. And of course there are various stages of the uh, distortion of, uh, of the sexuality in, in the homosexual orientation. Uh, there is the emotional attraction uh, and there is genital activity and not, not every person who uh, who has this difficulty or who's passing through a stage uh, which, which is not necessarily permanent, huh? not every person will, uh, will always be in that, w with that difficulty. And so the important thing is how to pastorally help such people to, uh, to return to an emotional uh, uh, and moral integrity. Huh? But, of course, uh, they need to be respected. And in the American language, uh, you have a distinction between the word homosexual and gay. Mm -hmm. A homosexual is a person who has, to some extent, uh, this homosexual condition. And somebody may have this difficulty, and, and uh, his friends, his neighbors, will not know about this. He's dealing with this, with the cooperation, with the grace of God, and may come out of this, dignity, this difficulty and come back to, uh, to normal human relationships. Sometimes adolescents, in a moment when, when their uh, sexual sensibility is, is appearing, and, and if they have been distorted by others, they go through a phase of, of, of difficulty in this field. But as they mature, they will grow out of it. Huh? Whereas a gay is somebody who says, I am like this, I will be like this, I want to be treated like this, and I want special privileges because I am like this. Uh, now, if somebody is not only a homosexual, but a gay, declaring, this is how I am, and this, I want this to be uh, respected legally, uh, socially, and so on, such a person will never come out of the difficulty. Uh, the important thing is when somebody has a, a homosexual tendency is to tell such an individual 
this is not everything that you are. There are many other qualities in you which are good. You may be an artist, you may be a writer, you may be good in your work, you may be a sportsman, you know, you're, you're charitable. There are many aspects of your being. Whereas a gay focuses on this condition and makes out of it the supreme sacrament, the supreme justification, the supreme expression of the identity of the individual. But once that is elevated and treated as the supreme, the most important bit of information that we have about the individual, such an individual will never free himself from this perverted state and he will never be happy. And, and uh, homosexual activities of gays who are affir affirming their, their, their identity doesn't lead to permanent relationships, doesn't lead to the transmission of life. Huh? It is a distortion. Huh? And so the church standing up to this ideology which, which we are seeing now, certainly in the Western world, huh? the church is saying something very normal and, and humane which corresponds to, to, to the understanding of humanity, which humanity has had for millennia, long before Christ, <laughs> long, before, long before the appearance of Christianity. Huh? So it's not a question of the church fighting the ideology, it's, it's a question of a distortion of humanity and the church standing up in defense of human dignity. And the church, because the church is focused on Christ, and in Christ the divinity and humanity are tied in one, uh, in one person, the two, two natures. So in Christ we are seeing the human nature on its supreme level as it is elevated, glorified from within by the divinity. And so by focusing on Christ, uh, we have the supreme answer about anthropology, about pedagogy, about psychology, <laughs> about morals, you know. Christ shows us a humanity which is supremely transformed from within by the divinity. Now we have access to the grace of God through our faith, through the sacraments. And by living out the grace of God, that grace of God heals whatever distortions we may have, whatever difficulties we may have, on the condition that we initiate, we commence the pilgrimage, we start the journey of living out our lives with the grace of God.